Hello, I'm Damien, and today I'm going to talk about layer 7 load balancing. A few words about me. I wrote my first line of C 20 years ago, 23 years ago even. Uh, I worked on many AMD devices. I, uh, I'm a GNOME contributor. I've worked at Intel on the kernel, the Linux kernel. I, I spent four years doing graphics driver. So if you're running Linux, there's a good chance you have some of my code, and I'm sorry. So let's talk about load balancing. First, what is this talk is going to be about? Why do we need layer seven load balancing, especially? Um, let's we'll break down the different parts of what compose what composes load balancing. Uh, we'll look at different architecture, how to implement that within your cluster. And I have to say, in the context of this talk. Load balancing is not about ingress, it's about the traffic within your cluster. Uh, we have a look at a fairly recent algorithm um, from 2016 called constant hashing with bounded loads. And then how hard this can really be, right? It's, so we, we'll have a small demo about and a bit of code about implementing all of this. So first things first, I'm sure everyone knows, knows that, but what is a Kubernetes service and Kubernetes service and endpoints? Let's say you have a microservice in your cluster and you decide that four pods will be, will, will be fine for the microservice, that it will be able to handle the load you, you're going to throw at it. The service object in Kubernetes abstracts those four pods into something front-facing. You can call, it has a VIP, a virtual IP address, and you connect to that VIP and by the magic of DNAT, you end up in one of the pods that you've been defining. Of course, I'm sure everyone knows what DNAT is, but it, it's destination netting. You'll be rewriting the IP header to rewriting the VIP you're being connected to, to one of the IP and port of the endpoint. Demo. It's a bit soon to, make, to do a demo, but we'll try. So I have... Um, I have a few pods running. Uh, that's the four pods you had on the right. That's the service uh, abstracting those pods. And I'm going to run 100 requests to that service VIP out of, you know, with 20 requests a second. So that's going. Um, so you get some answers from the service. That's great. And now we're going to look, uh, I've instrumented the pods to tell me how many requests they've been handling. So we look at that and um, there's maybe a bit of a surprise, is the whole 100 requests ended up in a single pod. So what, what really happened here? Um, so yeah, just in case the demo didn't work. Um, what really happened here is there was a bit of a trick. I told the, the client doing the request to only do request with one goroutine, with one thread, if you want. Uh, and also, the request rate was low enough that the service had time to answer between the next requests. So what really happened is we only had one connection between the client and the service VIP. And because HTTP clients, HTTP one clients, do connection pooling, and they use Keep Alive to not have to reconnect every time, then we really had one connection for the whole hundred requests. And the way DNet works, it only looks at the first packet of a connection to, to decide which endpoint they, they're going to rewrite the VIP address to. That means the whole hundred requests were sent to using the same connection and all ended up in the same endpoint. And okay, in HTTP 1, when you do that, you, if, if your request rate is high enough, the client library will actually have to create new connections to send the request because um, the connection will be already used. And so you, you'll get some load balancing. Uh, the problem is with HTTP 2 and request multiplexing, you'd really need a single connection to send request with a high QPS, request per second. 
it's a, if you only have one connection, then you will have the problem of ending up on the same endpoint all the time. Let's step back a bit and try to summarize what we want from load balancing. Well, first point really, yes, we want to distribute the load, hopefully fairly fairly among endpoints. The next thing we want is affinity. That's a bit more advanced, and the idea is that several requests from the same client uh, can end up on some endpoint, and you can use that for optimizations. Um, in a very generic term, you may want to keep some state between two requests to be able to reuse it. It could be caching, it could be some intermediate results, it doesn't really matter, but what you want is to send the requests from the same client to the same endpoint. Locality is another very interesting property of load balancing. Um, two examples here. If your pod you want to connect to, uh, if the service you want to connect to has a pod running on the same node, you probably want to connect to that node, to that pod on the same node, rather than trying to go on a different rack or, or availability zone or data center. So there's some kind of cache hierarchy there, um, very similar to cache hierarchies, where you, you want to connect to the closest pod, whatever the closest means. Um, okay, that's, that's about performance, but there's also a cost issue to that. If you have a cluster spawning availability, availability, availability zone, the traffic between AZs is costly. So when you connect to a microservice, you'd rather the pod of the microservice to be in the same AZ, rather than have to cross the boundary and pay for, for that traffic. And the next thing is, the last thing is circuit breaking. And this, this has to do with everything um, with unhealthy pods um, that can happen from time to time. And when you do have an unhealthy pod, you want to remove the pod from the pool of endpoints you, you can reach uh, for, for that service. Uh, right. uh, Kubernetes provides some of, some of the circuit breaking, uh, passive circuit breaking, by, with the liveliness and readiness probes. If Kubernetes detects your pod is unhealthy, it will remove it from the service endpoints, the list of service endpoints. Now, let's have a look at the perspective of L4 versus layer 4 versus layer 7. L4 is all about connections, as we've seen. L4 affinity is not very useful. If you think about it, the only thing at the L4 layer you can do for affinity is to look at the source and destination IPs and ports and try to make some decision based on that. But in, in, especially in the context of microservices talking into your cluster, those information doesn't really give you anything. On the other hand, as layer 7 is all about requests, and that allows you very, very fine granularity on things you can do. Um, first thing is actually can do a better load distribution. Imagine a client doing one request a second and the other client doing 50 requests a second. If you, they, don't, they so have two connections, right? Each client has one connection. If you do that at layer 4, you end up with one pod being 50 times more loaded than the other pod. If you do that at the request level, you can actually spread the 51 request across many pods. Um, Affinity now can use a lot more information. Because you're passing the higher level protocol, you can use uh, a, a HTTP header, you can use a URL, part of the URL, to be the key, to be the identifier uh, that is going to route that request to the same endpoint. And then that enables you to have a more fine-grained uh, circuit breaking. Uh, um, for instance, you can look at the request responses, and if you see that one endpoint is only giving 500 errors back, you may want to remove that endpoint from the set of endpoints of the service. Let it cool, cool off a bit, and maybe try again later, but you don't really want that endpoint to, to return errors for ev everyone. Yeah. OK. let's. Let's illustrate the diversity that layer 7 load balancing enables you. The columns here are the different load balancing algorithms you can find in the wild. The rows are various components, proxies, and at the end, uh, uh, well, the service mesh with Istio and a client library with GoKit. The first two columns are not very smart, but they, they do their job. Uh, 
you have to imagine a request coming into the system and you have to be you have to choose one of the endpoints. You can choose that endpoint at random or in round robin fashion. And that will already answer some that will already provide some benefits. For instance, the one request versus 50 requests a second, for each of those requests, you can just pick one, one endpoint at random, and that will spread the load. So that's already something. The next two columns are a, sm a bit smarter, and for that, they need a bit more state per endpoint. In this case, let's, let's see, we, we, we're going to add the notion of load, and the load is the number of requests currently being handled by an endpoint. So if the load is 12, that means the, this endpoint is currently handling 12 requests. What you can do then is you can look at the list of endpoints and pick up the one with the fewer requests and give the new request arriving to this endpoint. So you have a bit, something a bit more smart, sm smarter than random. You actually have more information. You have the number of requests that is handling. So that's the f what I call full scan list loaded. You, you look at the full list of endpoints and you pick the list loaded one. There's a very interesting result that is actually very, very broad and applies to more than load balancing. If you, instead of looking at the whole list of endpoints, if you just pick two endpoints at random and choose the one with the fewest request, it's nearly as, nearly as good as the full scan. Actually, it's a constant, um, like the big O notation, it's just a constant as bad, right, if you want to. So it's quite optimal to do that uh, in terms of, of time, being, uh, time spent doing the load balancing. And the last two columns are algorithms that have to do with affinity. And I'll talk about them a bit later. So let's have architecture boxes here. Everyone loves those. Uh, we, we, let's try to answer the, the question where le the layer 7 load balancing happens in your cluster. This should be looking quite familiar now. This is basically Istio and Envoy, uh, service meshes as they define it. Um, you have a workload and you have two workloads, A and B. Um, I've drawn a pod of the, of the two workloads, or even pods. What you do is you, for each pod, you insert a, a proxy container, and because your application container and the, that proxy container share the same uh, network namespace, you can transparently re redirect all the traffic through the proxy with, for instance, IP tables rules. And what happens next is that the, proxy, the, the load balancing is happening within the proxy, and the proxy will connect to, with, for the request to another proxy somewhere else, and then uh, arrive to the destination pod. And at the bottom, you have the control plane, which is this magical thing that will actually go and parameter all the proxies depending on what you want to do. And this is quite general, of course. Uh, Envoy and, and Istio do a lot more than load balancing. Uh, the whole traffic management uh, suite. So this approach is quite nice. Um, it's language ag agnostic because it's, it's a different process. You can do, you don't have to do, uh, you, you can write your application in whatever it, it works. The clients are very simple. They don't have to know anything about load balancing, anything about traffic management. It will just work. That's quite a nice property. But you have the proxy in the data path. All your, all your traffic is going through the proxy. It has a bit of latency overhead and a, lot of, a bit of CPU usage as well. There's one rule here, you, you have to benchmark things for yourself and see if that's acceptable. And chances are, it is. The next way you can do this load balancing is have pretty much the opposite. Everything in the client. So the client becomes quite heavy, they they can directly connect to the Kubernetes API server to get the list of endpoints, and they have all the logics within themselves to choose the endpoint uh, using one of the many algorithms we just saw. And that gives you quite some nice control. Um, so let's see. Well, there are some drawbacks. That means because it's within the client that you need this library for every language you use in your application, which can be a problem. But there's no extra hop in the data path. The, rec the client it's itself doing all the things. And that's a price to pay to have full control of what you're doing. 
if you look, if you remember that table, not every solution had all the algorithms. So if you want something very precise, then maybe you can't reach it with your current solution. But if you do something in the client, then you do exactly what you want. And there's uh, interesting middle ground behavior I actually discovered preparing this talk, which is the Lucas side load balancing. It's a middle ground, as in, you extract away all, all the logic to do load balancing in a load balancer service, that's the top most uh, box. So the, your, your client go and goes and asks this service, what endpoint can I use, please? And the, the load balancing logic is all there. But the client itself will do the request. So that, that gives you some abstraction, so you don't have to, do, to write 10 libraries, and remove the, the, the proxy from the data path. That's quite, kind of an interesting one. I haven't seen many, many solutions with that, but it's something I want to explore for sure. Okay, let's talk about a bit about affinity. And consistent hashing with bounded loads, which was in the abstract at least. So this is the hash ring. I'm guessing people are starting to be familiar with that. Uh, consistent hashing is quite prevalent in distributed services. It's everywhere. Uh, but let's, let's, let's go through it step by step. Let's say you have a hash function, xxx hash for instance, xxx hash for instance is a good one. This is 32 bit hash function and you can represent those, the whole results of the hash on a circle. At the top you have zero and you go clockwise to 2 power, 30, two power 32 minus one. What you can do with that? Well, you have the, if you remember, you have those four endpoints. They are identified by an IP address and a port probably. You can hash these strings, and the result of the hash ends up somewhere in that hash ring. So that's what I did here, and they're all in the ring. Now, we still want to answer the problem. What happens when a request arrives in the system? Where, where should it go? Which endpoint should it select? So a request arrives. You inspect it to grab a key that you want to do your affinity with. So if it's a if you want to route all the client's requests to the same endpoint, you maybe have a HTTP header doing that. And because you have that key, that key has a value and you put it somewhere in the, in the, in the ring. And the way it works, or the way you can select the endpoint that is going to handle that request is just to go clockwise on the hash ring and choose the endpoint that is right next to it. But that's, that's not really load balancing, and for the very simple reason. If you have a client doing the 50 requests with the same key and a client doing a one request with the same key, you have 50 requests ending up, ending up in the blue one, and maybe the one request ending up in the yellow one, which is not really load balancing, is it? So in arrives question hashing with bounded loads, and the idea around it is to try to avoid an endpoint getting smashed by, or hotspotted by, uh, by, by a client or a special key, if you want. And the way to define that, or the way they define it, is to have an invariant saying, no endpoint can be more loaded than a factor of the average. Maybe that's not entirely clear, but we will try to clear it up. Um, so you have to augment your hash ring with data, and this, this, this time it's the load. For each endpoint, you keep the load. That's an idea we've already seen. So for instance, here, the green one has 23 requests at the moment. The, your request arrives, being hashed, and that's somewhere in the hash ring. And then you have your question, can this endpoint handle the request? And the way you answer it is, OK, I have 100 requests in my system which means the average load of each endpoint is 100 divided by 4, 25. And my invariant is I don't want any endpoint to have more load than 25 times my constant. That constant I chose here, 1.2, 1.2 times 25 is 30. So I don't want any endpoint to have more than 30 load. When the request arrives, it should be handled by the blue one. But if the blue one handles it, that means you have 30 requests plus one, 31 requests. And we just said, no, we don't want that. 
So you just pick the next one on the ring. And you get, well, the purple one will handle the request. So if you can imagine here that you have a mix between affinity, you try to stick your sessions, if you want, or your users to the same endpoint. But if the endpoint is too loaded, then you go to the next one. And I, I have this, maybe that's better explained with this kind of affinity scale I've, def I've imagined. Um, you have the scale between no affinity and persistence. Obviously, random and run robin and, and power of two choice list loaded are no affinity. They, they don't even look at the data at uh, this level. On the other end of the spectrum, you have constant hashing, uh, which is, for instance, used by sharding, where you always end up in the same endpoint. Well, except if the endpoint is being removed from the hash ring, but that's a common case. And in the middle, you have constant hashing with bounded load. And because you have this uh, factor that you can act on, you, if as, as C tends to, as the constant tends toward infinity, you allow the system to, ha you, ha you allow one endpoint to have a lot more load than the average. So as, as, as C goes to infinity, it looks very, very much like constant hashing. But on the other end of the spectrum, if C t tends toward one, then you end up with random. So that's an interesting factor you can use to uh, tune your load balancing. All right, and very, very briefly, um, I want to touch about locality, and there's, there's a very interesting expressive abstraction there, which is the end, uh, a subset of endpoints. A service, we said, is a set of endpoints, but what if we could define subsets of that? For instance, if you have AZs in your cluster, you can subset your endpoints by, by AZ. So in this case, if I have four endpoints and two AZ, that that's how it is. And that allows you to, on the client side, when you actually do the request, to uh, select the subset of pods you're interested in. Uh, if you're in the green AZ, you want, you want, to, uh, you want to connect to the, the green pods, of course. And you can load balance between those two if you want to. And you can think about a lot of strategies to fall back if, if, if the green AZ isn't, isn't available, for instance, or, to, um, or if they're too loaded. All right, so how hard can this really be? Um, and I mean, so I've, I've played a bit with a client-side library, it's on GitHub. Um, and the, the way I tested it is by writing a small reverse proxy, and I'm sure everyone knows what a reverse proxy is. Um, but in any case, that's the thing in the middle. Uh, you can make client requests to it, and we'll just forward it to one of the endpoints. Um, as a, I abstracted the constant hashing and bounded loads with a small interface. The first and the first method is really to tell the ring what is the next, what is the set of endpoints we're talking about, and the second two are, and the two last, well, making request and request are sentinel calls you can put before making a request and after making a request. And basically, you want to make a request, you ask the load balancing algorithm where is the endpoint I can actually have. And at the end, you release this endpoint, and that, that's used to, um, handle, to, um, to tweak the load for each endpoint, of course. Now, the, the service discovery part is just, a, is just a Kubernetes API call. You watch the endpoint object, you receive events uh, when the endpoint object changes. For instance, if you scale down or up your service, this will change the set of endpoints. So, and based on those events, you can update the ring with the, the set of endpoints that you currently have. And then the reverse proxy proper is based on the Go standard library reverse proxy. And you can see that first it looks at a header um, that contains the key that is the base of your constant hashing. It gets the endpoint for that key it redir redirects the, um, the request to the right endpoint, and at the end, call and request to, to decrease the load. A bit about um, circuit breaking. I haven't really done much on, in this uh, prototype. It just relies on the 
default uh, active Kubernetes Kubernetes socket breaking, if if your pod is not is not answering the liveliness probe, Kubernetes will restart it. And of course, it could be enhanced as at will with the various circuit breaking algorithms you can you can find around. There's, there are many. Um, yeah, we can we definitely talk about this. If all right, demo. So um, yes. Oops. What am I? So I've, I've written a small client, it's in a GitHub repo as well, um, that does, I can actually get that better. Um, what he does, he has two go routines, and each go routine is sending a hundred requests with, with two different, and each go routine uses a different affinity key. Um, the affinity keys are called Mark and Sophie, why not? Um, so that's it, and it's a bit, I have a bit of a... Yeah, nope. So I, the, the, I, I, I instrumented the proxy to give me stats about this, so... But it's a bit uh, awkward to, to get, we'll still do it. Okay, so what you see here is a bit of debug messages because to, to have the, the ring at, at the endpoints. And then you have some stats about where the Mark and Sophie keys ended up. And so Mark, the, f the first line is Mark ended up in, the, in this endpoint 17 times. So you can see that you have some kind of strong affinity in at least one of the endpoints for, for, Mark is, for the Mark keys, the second one. And the rest is spread a bit um, among the other endpoints. So you get both. And the, I think the constant here was 125. So you, yeah, you, you, get, you get some behavior that looks like it's right. Takeaways. So Levenser, 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 layer 7 load balancing is a necessity going forward. I don't think. Clusters can, can get away with that now. Uh, applications really need that in many different levels. Um, actually, it turns out that making a client library is, is fairly straightforward, especially if you use the, Kube, um, the um, Kubernetes API directly. And that's actually a practical solution, or pragmatic even solution, that works today, and you can do exactly what you want there. As I mentioned, using the Kubernetes, um, Kubernetes API is a library is actually quite powerful, and you're using your orchestration engine as as the base of for for your logic. Something I noticed and that's maybe interesting is you have a lot of primitives to do pod placement in Kubernetes. You can, for instance, you can say I want two pods on on this node, or no more than one pod on or two pods on this node, uh, using the various affinity um, primitives. But that's used for the scheduling part of it. But for the service part of it, you have no usage of that, which something that definitely could be improved. There's something a bit weird about the service IPs. Like all of this completely bypasses the service IP, and that's not very. That's not a nice feeling to bypass part of the platform. Um, and you have solutions that are that are building other abstractions with CRDs, for instance. And the question is, how much of this can be folded back into Kubernetes itself to maybe try to limit the fragmentation around, around this kind of problematic? Um, if, for instance, the, the endpoint subset would, is kind of interesting and expressive um, object we, we, people may want to add to the platform itself. The demo code is here. It's absolutely and definitely prototype code. Do not put that into production. Uh, it will not work. Um, that said, I have promised my coworkers that I'm going to solve that for our own clusters. So I will have something at some point. It'll be open source uh, if anyone is interested. Uh, I'll, yeah, we'll announce it somewhere in, in our blog or something. I've, I've a bunch of references here. The topic is actually very, very deep and interesting. 
if you're interested, please feel free to, to look at any of those. They're pretty good. And that's it. Any questions? Oh. Is there a microphone somewhere? Uh, not, sorry, can you speak up? I actually don't get you. So sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Where are you? Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. So, first of all, thank you so much for the speech. That's exactly a problem that we're facing right now. So. <laughs> My question is around scaling. So uh, in a scenario where load balancing with affinity, uh, you have a number of endpoints in the ring and then you scale the ring, um, the affinity will change. Right. So have you, do you have any suggestion about how to preserve this affinity in case so of a very dynamic environment where the number of endpoints can go up and down? Um, so I think that a very general comment is you don't want to only rely on affinity. As in, the state you build inside your, uh, your, your, your endpoint has to be rebuildable. So if, if your endpoint goes away, you can rebuild that state in another endpoint. And that, that's a very general you know, uh, comment about how you want to organize your states inside a, a very highly dynamic environment. Um, so that's, that's really the answer I have. Uh, if, you, if you can, it'll be, it's, you can rebuild your state. If you can't, um, let's say you f uh, a service, for instance, if you imagine a service that is actually a GDB core watcher, you, you know you have core files, and you have GDB to um, explore your core file. The service, well, what, the, what the service would do, it would fork a GDB instance, download the core file, load into GDB, and you give you say a prompt. In this kind of environment, the context is massive, right? The context is, is forking GDB uh, and loading uh, a core file. And if the endpoint goes away, the whole session goes away, and you can't rebuild it because you're forking GDB. In that case, well, there's no good solution, really. You can rebuild it the state elsewhere, that's fine, but you probably want to have the user, to tell the user that something bad happened, and you're, you know, you're restarting the session. Uh, so, yeah, that's, that's it, really. Thank you so much. I'll be happy to follow up uh, with more questions later about this. Sure, of course. And uh, I have another one that is not strictly related. Um, it's about using TLS inside a cluster. Mm -hmm. So in the case where the connection between service A and service B goes over TLS, obviously header inspection is impossible. So you cannot use that mechanism uh, for affinity. Any suggestion around that? Um, you can still use the get parameters, for maybe? <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Any more questions? So, for from the examples, it feels like you refer mostly to HTTP. Yes. Do you plan to support the pluggable interfaces to handle different protocol protocols? So, so read data from binary protocols because there is not only HTTP to be balanced. Um. The gRPC, well, I guess that's the HTTP, but the gRPC, yes, that would be feasible. For the rest, it's quite generic. It's a quite generic uh, question, isn't it? Uh, but you, you can re you can apply the same mechanism. Um, but that's an interesting. Well, I had really no concrete plans on that. No, um, but why not? You know, it sounds possible.
So I think, uh, yeah, first of all, thanks for interesting talk and presentation. And I think what previous question was really about and uh, what other people might be wondering of is, uh, is it kind of a project you are just starting with uh, this approach or any other products exist or maybe planned by some companies or we work this planning for that or? So, first of all, it's not a lot of code, but you always benefit from having a project that is used by more than one companies and mature over time, etc. Um, there are some microservices libraries, and I'm talking about Go especially, uh, that implement some of the load balancing. I, I cited um, GoKit. GoKit has uh, random and run Robin. So this could be part of GoKit. Uh, there's no, uh, but I have no, it, yes, it's a project I'm starting, and I have no concrete plan at this point. Uh, but if people are interested, I'm absolutely interested in, uh, into, in sharing a bit of that uh, code and contributing, you know, uh, having something mature. I think there's another question here. <laughs> Thank you. Please raise your hand. After that, or do you want to answer that question first? I'm not oh, sure. I okay. Didn't, <laughs> didn't hear, hear it. Okay, I'll continue probably. <laughs> Uh, you were saying uh, that you found a middle approach, uh, which may work when you mm. yeah when you ask for endpoints, and uh, you said that you didn't find uh, some products. But yeah. when you have console or etcd, which is like discovery mechanisms, are they in data data pass? I, I think they are doing exactly that. If maybe I'm mistaken, but okay, a bit. Where, so so let's say when you you have console or uh, it gives you actually endpoints, and I saw. I'm not sure, but I think console doesn't stay in the data path between your client and uh, and the service. Uh, um, I'm not sure if it does the load balancing part. Like it will do the service discovery part, but yeah. the, the one of the objective is to move the code, the load balancing code, the code that decides which endpoint to use, into that service. Mm. So you basically put the consistent hashing into that service. Okay. I think uh, I think we're done with this question questions. Uh, Thank you all.